we're going to get started with asking, um, all right, we're going to get started, started. Um, Professor Gavin Giovannoni is here this morning, and he's from uh, Barts in London uh, School of Neurology and Dentistry. Uh, I saw his program yesterday, and it's really quite very interesting, so um, I think you're going to enjoy this. It has to do with the quality of life and research in, in MS. Now, uh, Professor Giovannoni needs to catch a flight um, right after, so we're not going to take any questions and answers. However, the professor has uh, graciously uh, offered to do a blog about his presentation and then take any questions uh, and answer them on the blog. So, Professor, thank you very much, and you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason why I have to leave, I've got to get to Newcastle. My daughter is starting university. Tomorrow, a fresh start. So I thought I have to be at, uh, at least try and get there uh, to, to, to <coughs> see her into a room. Anyway, so um, today I, I was asked to talk about MS treatment management and improving quality of life. I gave a very similar, I had a similar title yesterday and I thought I should change the title of the talk to at least give you some resources that you can use to uh, empower yourselves to uh, improve your own quality of life. So I do have a lot of disclosures which are probably not that relevant for today's presentation. And um, the reason we have all these disclosures is because our centre where I work at Barts in the London is very active in doing clinical trials. And I sit on quite a few steering committees uh, and I'm the principal investigator in terms of running trials for quite a few uh, compounds <coughs> in MS. So I thought what I'd do is what we do at Barts, and we call ourselves Barts MS. Uh, Barts MS is a term that captures both the university, the research side, and the hospital, the NHS side. And so we try not to dis differentiate because they so interleave the research and the clinical services that we prefer to use the term Bart's MS to define what we do on both sides. And I've got those little bubbles there just to, to, uh, to go through some of the things we do to try and empower people with MS. <coughs> so what's quite clear is our group uh, at Bart's have been very active over the last 15 years, or maybe 10 years, I've only been there 11 years, <coughs> um, in trying to do these types of things. It's trying to empower and bring people with multiple sclerosis together <coughs> and to educate them and, and activate them to be more proactive in their management. Uh, not, not everybody engages because there are some people who don't. Uh, and what I've just observed over the last few years is that the people who are very engaged with what we do are doing much, much better. They seem to be doing a lot better in terms of their outcomes, staying employed. Uh, and uh, I kept asking the question, why is this happening? So I, I've been doing a lot of research around it, and it's quite clear that it's got to do with the social determinants of health. So people who engage in the management of their disease, who participate actively uh, in the initiatives around the management of MS, just do better. And I assume the fact that you're here today, you're part of that group, because the people who are not here today are the ones that are missing out. And uh, you're probably aware that MS is an incredibly socially isolating disease. Okay, and we have this term in, in sociology called social capital. So social capital is essentially your network, how big your network is in terms of family, friends, work acquaintances, and how connected you are to society. And uh, the psychiatrists have known about this for a long, long time. Those people with reduced social capital do very badly in terms of overall survival, mental health outcomes. And we haven't studied this in MS, and we're uh, about to do a research program in this, and I'm almost certain that the same thing would apply to people with multiple sclerosis. People with small social networks, reduced social capital, are going to do, do, do badly. Because that's what we need. We need our social networks to help us. <coughs> and so if you're interested in doing this, um, I would recommend these two books, The Health Gap, uh, and the, actually the spirit level is probably uh, even more insightful in terms of the wider social uh, determinants of health. And this goes through those issues um, <coughs> around what's important for, for maintaining health. <coughs> it's quite scary how little control healthcare professionals have over these things because they include things like housing, transport, education. These are the things that happen at a, at a political so society level. <coughs> And so the three E's are education, engagement, and empowerment. So this is what I'm going to talk to you today about, because if you can get all these three E's done, then your quality of life is going to be a lot better than if you don't get all these three E's done. 
And it's basically taking responsibility, essentially, for your own uh, uh, management uh, and uh, learning how to self-manage. Yes. Where did you send the book? What? Where did you send the book? Where do I send? Did you send the book? I don't sell books, but I've got a website. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the link okay. then. Yeah, okay. And I'll put, all the, I'll put this presentation online already for you, okay? So you don't have to take pictures. So the first thing we, tr we try to innovate in our center was service development because uh, the way we're thinking about MS services changing, and I'm not sure what it's like in Ireland. In the past, the general practitioner, the family doctor, used to be the controller of everything. Uh, and then there was this thing called the uh, um, chronic health, the directive came out for the NHS about management of chronic diseases, chronic, health, chronic disease health directive. And that shifted chronic diseases into specialist groups. Uh, and so the neurologist then became the focus of looking after. And now in the, U, in the NHS, if you've got multiple sclerosis, you're meant to be plugged into an MS service for life. Uh, the reason for that is, is the general practitioners just do not have the resources to look after all the issues um, that happen to people with MS. And the neurologists were so overburdened that we had to actually um, create specialist nurses and uh, specialist nurses then took over that burden. And so they actually, at the moment, in our centre, control everything. Uh, we just don't have the time. And I assume it's even worse in Ireland because the ratio of neurologists to, pop to the population in Ireland is not that great. Um, anyway, we're trying to shift it even more. We want the MS, that's the term, uh, shift MS um, came up with to describe somebody with disease, a neutral term, is they become the, the, the center. They manage their own disease and they pull in people who they need when they need them. And we were just discussing at breakfast this morning this exact issue. If you've got a bladder problem, you need a bladder scan. If you, know, if you understand what the issues are with bladder, you don't go to your neurologist. You go to the continence advisor to get the bladder scan, and they will tell you if you need a medication or not. So you, you can actually bypass um, roadblocks and get to people who can help you. If you've got a falling problem or a tripping problem, maybe the best person to see is a physio rather than a neurologist. You see, So these are the kinds of things where if you take control of your disease and understand it, you can actually direct yourself. Now, trying to get direct referrals, um, bypassing the MS nurse or the neurologist, is not easy in the NHS. We managed to get it right. If somebody's got a swallowing problem in, in, with MS, um, our speech therapists take direct referral, self-referral. Similarly, our certain continence advisors will take self-referral. Our podiatrists will take self-referral. Some of the physiotherapy services now take self-referral, and our, one of our occupational therapy services take self-referral. So in other words, you don't have to go by your general practitioner, your nurse or your neurologist, you just self-refer. And I think that's the way uh, healthcare services in the future should be. The patient who is educated, knows what they need, should be able to um, control where they go to. Sounds, it's not very radical. This, this happens in a lot of other healthcare services, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in, in, in Switzerland. Anyway, this is the uh, 70th anniversary of the NHS, uh, and uh, you can see the waiting room there. This is actually the, the Manchester Royal Infirmary. It doesn't look any different if you go, uh, if you come to our hospital, it's identical, it's just more modern. We still have a Victorian uh, healthcare model where people have to come to the hospital to see the consultant, wait, and the amount of time that's wasted in terms of traveling and everything. I would imagine in Ireland it's exactly the same. You've got to go off to some specialist center, get into a motor vehicle, park, get out, wait, and then when you get in, you may have 10 minutes or 15 minutes and you don't get looked after properly and you come away feeling dissatisfied. I can tell you the neurologist is also dissatisfied because they feel they need more time. So there are lots of innovations happening and this just tries to capture some of them. So sometimes, for some problems, it's nice to have an asynchronous consultation. In other words, you don't need to be face-to-face -face there at the same time. You could just do it via email or a text or whatever. And we're actually now starting a large number of email consultations, um, which can sort out quite a few problems, <clears throat> and it solves all these issues of transfer. Um, the other one is um, where we talk about um, uh, like group clinics. Uh, in other words, you, common problems can be dealt with by sharing information, and we use our blog for that as well. And there are some healthcare apps that come out now where you can actually do group clinics uh, dealing with a problem asynchronously. So somebody's got a problem with bladder, you can self-manage bladder via uh, that. <clears throat> the other one is a uh, uh, um, different place, but uh, on the uh, same time. So that will be synchronous, but different places. 
And we're now beginning to increasingly use telephone and uh, we don't use Skype anymore because it's become problematic. We now be doing it what, via WhatsApp. So we do a WhatsApp call um, for follow-up, stop people having to come to the hospital. It's easier to just do the, the consultation via a telephone or WhatsApp. <clears throat> And the blue one there, it's uh, synchronous, same place, same person, is the old traditional model. So we try to break down these models. Sometimes it's easier said than done because the administrators, the managers, don't like to change. <clears throat> they prefer to just keep the things the same. Okay? So you're going to have to force your healthcare professionals to adopt these new models. They all exist. So this is our blog, so you're welcome to go onto it. Uh, and just to give you an example... Um, there are lots of posts on the blog. This is one about why the bladder is so important to people with the disease. And so this is a long post, but if you go through it, it tells you how to self-manage and all the issues around the investigation and the management of people with uh, bladder dysfunction. <clears throat> this led me to actually develop a, uh, an infographic. Now, this infographic some people don't like. Um, essentially, as you can see, it looks like the London. it's based on the London Underground. So my worldview is... Uh, you take a trip, uh, you start off at risk, you then go through the asymptomatic, the clinically isolated syndrome when you have your first attack, and then there's minimal, moderate, severe impairment, and then there's the terminal phase. Um, and at each point, there's issues around that. And then the other lines, this is the symptomatic therapy line, this is the therapy line, this is the terminal phase. I think you're listening to things this afternoon about advanced directives, living wills, that kind of thing. Um, the blue line, the purple line here is uh, symptomatic therapies, and the uh, orange line is disease modifying therapies. These are counseling, there's wellness, comorbidities, other diseases. This is, so, what we're trying to do is create an app that every, at every one of these stops you can click on it and it'll teach you about that particular aspect and how to self manage. <clears throat> um, and this app is uh, in, currently in development. It's going to be called MS Selfie for MS Self Management. Um, I'm hoping to make it go live um, uh, by Ectrims as a beta version, <clears throat> just for the disease-modifying therapy component. And it works as a website, it'll work as a, on, a, on a pad, and it'll work also on a mobile device. So it's got, it's, it's got uh, technology behind that allows it to be used on any device. I assume you've all got smartphones or access to these things? That's un somebody shaking their head. Okay. <laughs> It's very difficult to um, do, do everything for everybody. Anyway, so the other thing we really got involved in is, as I said to you, um, social determinants of health are p political. And so we've actually launched a policy initiative. And one of the policy initiatives is to try and get some of these concepts um, through to our healthcare, um, let's say, our politicians, <clears throat> is we'd launched this thing called Brain Health. And the Brain Health Initiative is very simple, is to create a better future for people with MS and their families, for people like you. And our overarching aim is to actually try and change the treatment target in MS. Uh, our treatment targets have been very narrow, very medicalized, and what we would like to do is maximize lifelong brain health. And the principle is very, very simple. Okay. Unfortunately, age is a, some people would call it a disease, but as you know, life is a neurodegenerative disease. So everybody who lives long enough will know this. They will get forgetful. <clears throat> they will get poor balance problems. They will get frail. And, so, uh, and, for, uh, and that happens to everybody. It's just uh, our brains were never designed by evolution to, to live to 70, 80, 90 years of age. So age is a neurodegenerative disease. <clears throat> and what protects you from getting those problems in old age is the size of your brain. We call that brain reserve and also the enrichment in the brain, cognitive reserve. And there's very good data showing that multiple sclerosis reduces both those. It shrinks the brain, and it also reduces your cognition. <clears throat> so those two factors that protect you from age-related problems get reduced by MS. And so if you want to get to old age and have a chance, you really need to maximize those things. Uh, and so that means treating MS very actively uh, up front <clears throat> to protect the brain so you can age normally. And so when you go back to this uh, picture here, there's a dotted line under construction. It's not finished. And the first one is uh, long-term remission, the MS cure, curing MS. We want to cure the, and then the last one there is healthy aging, normal aging. And so the, the principles of this um, policy document is how do we activate the community to um, uh, try and protect the brain until old age. 
And it's very, very simple. It's about time as brain. If we don't treat MS early enough, <clears throat> if we don't diagnose it, treat it very early, um, get, a, get on top of the disease very early, we're losing brain all the time. And so the whole idea is to try and uh, stimulate the uh, MS community to put in systems to speed up the whole process. That's what it's about. <clears throat> And uh, we're actually creating a tool where MS services will be able to rate themselves how good they are in implementing all these guidelines. They're pretty, they're pretty uh, obvious guidelines. You know, when you get referred to a neurologist, you shouldn't wait a year. You should get seen within four weeks or even quicker. People are laughing, okay? <laughs> but anyway, so one of the things we know is it's fine putting out policy statements, but nobody adopts... Uh, one of the things is information very rarely changes behavior. You know, we tell people not to smoke, doesn't, they don't stop smoking. So you need to have things that change, they call behavioral, they call change agents. So what we, in the moment we're designing this and we're hoping to get it funded so we can actually develop this. We're going to take it, the TripAdvisor model and we want to apply it to MS, called the MS Advisor. <clears throat> and this will allow you to uh, log on and sign up as a, uh, as a member. And then it'll allow you to rate your MS service. And those ratings will go back to your MS service and to tell them how good or bad they are. Okay? This is not a satisfaction survey because we know that satisfaction surveys aren't very good. Because that depends on how you're feeling that day and it also depends on how good your consultant or your nurse is at interacting with you. They can be very pleasant and smile and make you feel good, but that doesn't mean to say you're getting a good service. <clears throat> So what we kind of want to do in the, in the app is actually put all those things around the brain health document into the app. You know, how quickly did it take you to get a diagnosis? You know, did it take a week or six months? Six months is unacceptable. <clears throat> Were you monitored? Did you have your annual MRI scan? Were you given the results? Were you asked about monitoring? Uh, <clears throat> you know, was your DMTs explained to you? Did you get choices? These are the kind of things. Was your, was your relapse managed very actively? Did you get in within seven days to get your relapse assessed? Um, were you screened for high blood pressure, diabetes? Were you, was your weight taken? You know, all the things that we think need to be done. Okay, and were you actively engaged in education? And you can rate these things and write comments, and they'll go back to your healthcare professional. And this, this is going to this is going to cause a, quite a lot of havoc in the community. But that's what it's meant to do. Okay, it's meant to be uh, controversial. And then what will also happen is your um, MS service could potentially sign up, and they can actually use the app put information about themselves in, contact numbers, who they are, they can put educational things in. The app will also be designed to educate you. In other words, it'll get feeds to teach you about the disease, and you obviously tick things you want. If you want to get things about bladder, we'll send you bladder information. If you want to get things about cognition, we'll send you cognition information. So it's, we're hoping it's going to be a portal for uh, education. <clears throat> disease, DMTs are disease-modifying therapies. Okay, what do you call them in Ireland? Okay. Yep. So those are therapies that are designed to change the outcome of your disease in the long term. Symptomatic treatments are the opposite. They don't actually make a difference to your long-term outcome, but they actually improve symptoms like anti-fatigue drugs, anti-spastic drugs. So those two classifications. So the other thing is uh, Clinic Speaks. So Clinic Speaks is an online resource. So this is, build, this is something we've developed slowly. This is actually a, a website, and it's got a lot of little apps designed around specific issues that are difficult to communicate. Um, one of the things we uh, uh, did, um, some people in this room may be on a drug called natalizumab or Tysabri, and if you have a virus in your body called the JC virus, you can get this infectious complication called PML. And depending on how, uh, how long you've been on treatment and if you've had previous immune suppressive drugs, <clears throat> uh, and how high your antibody index is to the drug, you've got a different risk of getting PML. And so we created an online little tool uh, called the PML, uh, a PML Risk Calculator to allow you to assess your own risk of getting this infection. Um, we've also created a little infographic that allows you to be used in clinic. Uh, this is old because I had this on SlideShare, and SlideShare suspended my account. They say... <clears throat> They say I'm, uh, my slide presentations have got information in them that are uh, copyrighted and I'm breaking copyright rule and they're not prepared to take a chance. That's unfortunate. Um, anyway, um, when, uh, we've had, I mean, up until it was suspended, we had about 4 million views of these guides. Uh, and the MS Trust gave us a, an award for um, communicating this in a very simple way. 
This particular infographic, one sheet of paper, is very, very effective in communicating to an individual very complicated information in less than one minute, to be honest with you, to go through this, and they understand what the risk is. Um, the previous information sheets we had confused people. Okay, they used to, uh, 85 percent of people came back having no idea what PML is and what their PML risk is. With this, it's the opposite way around. 85 percent of people understand the risks and what it is. And so this is actually an example of um, less is much, much more. And it's also an example of why uh, you need people who know how to design uh, information. Uh, and so we have in our group a designer called Alison Thompson, who's, who's behind most of our design stuff. So she actually designed this. <clears throat> and so sometimes, and I'm just speaking to everybody, if you ever want to design something that wants to get across information, you really need to think very carefully how you do it. Uh, shared decision making. <clears throat> so also in our blog we try and explain to people how decisions are made around disease modifying therapy. This is an example of somebody who asked a question on the blog about should I start Copaxone, and glitterum acetate? And we go through all the issues um, around that decision making. And actually people found this very, very useful to see how complicated and all the issues that get taken into account when deciding on a, dis on a particular therapy for somebody. <clears throat> And so that's why I posed a list of questions, and these questions now are going to be on the MS selfie. So these are all the questions that if you have active MS, or you're going to be put onto a treatment, you need to answer these questions. You, you as an individual with the disease needs to answer every one of these questions if you really understand, to understand why you're going on to the treatment and what it's meant to do. <clears throat> it's a big take, a big ask, um, but it's worth spending time educating yourself before going on to a treatment. And it, this is quite influential because <clears throat> the thing about the internet is that you get read all over the world. And uh, a particular person with a disease read this particular blog post, <clears throat> went to the neurologist in Wellington, New Zealand, and asked, they spent in the clinic and asked the neurologist to answer all those questions. And the reason why I know is that particular neurologist contacted uh, Professor David Miller at Queen Square. <clears throat> who I used to work with, and he's from New Zealand, and he said, is this Giovanni character kosher? You know, does he, is, is this reliable? So you can actually um, activate people across the, across the world to actually empower themselves to go and ask the relevant questions, as, uh, and they need answers to these questions, because the treatments are not without risks, uh, and so you need to understand the benefits uh, and the risks before making a decision. And so sometimes information is very powerful. <clears throat> And it allows you to question your decision making of your healthcare professionals. The other thing we also do is we share our protocols. So, you know, we have some unique protocols, for example, how to manage this is a uh, protocol on how to manage low lymphocytes. You know, the lymphocytes are the white blood cells that fight infections, and some of our therapies cause lymphopenia, low, low lymphocyte counts. And this is a, uh, an example of how uh, one of our protocols on how to manage. And the lymphocyte, low lymphocyte counts on a drug called Tecfidera, dimethyl fumarate. Some of you may be on the drug, which is why we monitor the bloods to see if you develop the lymphopenia. Because if you are lymphopenic, it puts you at risk of certain infections, and we try and reduce that. <clears throat> and so this is what MS self is going to look like uh, when it comes out, and, you'll, and, and all those protocols will be embedded into the MS selfie. Okay, so this is... Um, end-stage rheumatoid joint. <clears throat> so some of you may know people with rheumatoid arthritis. So that's the commonest autoimmune disease of the joints, whereas MS is the commonest autoimmune disease of the brain and spinal cord. And this is what happened in the past. So this is what happened when we didn't have effective therapies. People used to end up with end-stage, very deformed. Um, this is a, what I would call the secondary or primary progressive phase, advanced stage <clears throat> of RA. Uh, at least the rheumatologists had the opportunity to replace joints. You know, we in the neurology community can't replace the brain and spinal cord. We don't have that luxury. So we have to actually have a different strategy. Is how do we protect the brain and spinal cord so we keep get it into old age? Um, the rheumatologists um, had therapies. They call them DMARDs. They also did disease-modifying treatments. And they've actually developed a very active um, protocol of how to treat the, rheumatolo the uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis very effectively early on to protect the joints. And they've been so effective that the, ne the number of joint replacements required has dropped by almost 90%. Isn't that amazing? 
It varies depending on which country you're in, <clears throat> but about 90%. And so we're hoping if we adopt the same principles as rheumatologists, we will reduce the number, the need for wheelchairs and walking sticks and all those issues to the same degree. <clears throat> okay, and so the principle is very, very simple. It's to how do we treat early to maximize. So as soon as you treat too late, you've already lost brain, and so therefore your trajectory is going to be worse. So we want people to be on the early trajectory. So the whole policy, um, this policy document is around um, ac activating the community. And it's shifting the treatment target. So we now actually have a, a treat to target approach. Uh, we define what we want to do with our therapies, and that's to switch off all inflammation in the brain and spinal cord. And we measure it using clinical and MRI. <clears throat> this is why you have to have MRI monitoring. Uh, yeah. And we even go beyond that. Some of us are even targeting other markers. <clears throat> One of the markers we target is actually a, a spinal fluid marker. So in some people, we do lumbar punctures to measure the protein in the spinal fluid. And this protein tells us if there's ongoing damage occurring, and we try and even normalize that. <clears throat> and the whole purpose of that is to protect the end organ, okay? <coughs> to give you an opportunity of aging normally. <clears throat> and so uh, this, this particular thing has really happened in stroke. As you know, there now are effective treatments in stroke to break up the clot and try and protect the brain. And the whole thing about stroke or brain attack is how do we get people who have stroke into hospital as soon as possible onto these drugs that block that uh, break up the clot, get the blood going again, and if they can't do that, they go in and they suck out the clot called thromb thrombectomy. And so there's been a revolution uh, in the management of stroke. Our hospital has gone from thrombolysis rates of about 3% to about 35% in terms of giving it, and the mortality, the, the, uh, the people dying of stroke has dropped by over 30%. Okay. It, and also what's also happened, there's been a shift. Most people now are coming out with less disability from their strokes. And so we need to do the same in MS. And so that's why we got this policy document to uh, activate the community. It's not only focusing on treatments that target the multiple sclerosis component, okay? We're also targeting other things. Just to say to you that we're trying to build a pyramid, a sandwich. <clears throat> and we have now very effective anti-inflammatory drugs. These are drugs to switch off the inflammation. But unfortunately, we can't repair damage. <clears throat> And so what happens in people with them is they get very despondent because they go into a therapy, stops them having relapses, and, you know, and they see the condition still deteriorating. And so this deterioration that occurs on therapy sometimes has nothing to do with the fact that MS is active. It's because you've had damage in the past. And those nerve fibers have been working and they're damaged, but they can't survive and they die off over time. And that's why we, we need to actually start with drugs that protect the nerves. That's called neuroprotection. We need to remyelinate the ones that are remyelinated, and we need to try and restore lost function. And so we are doing trials now. There's no drugs licensed yet, but we're trying to add on therapies to the existing anti-inflammatories. <clears throat> and then we also need to focus on the so-called things that we know damage the health of the brain that have nothing to do with MS. Things like smoking. I shouldn't ask, but how many of you still smoke? Yeah. Not good, eh? Okay. You can move on to healthier options, like uh, e-cigarettes, for example. Okay? <laughs> Exercise, you're going to hear about that later. It's, a, it's, it's probably the most studied neuroprotective uh, drug we have, exercise. Think of it as a therapy. Diet, um, they, we don't have very good evidence for that, but there's evidence outside of MS that diet makes a difference to cardiovascular, cardiovascular risk. Too much alcohol is not good for you. Poor sleep is also not good for you. If you've got high blood pressure, diabetes is not good for you. Obviously, to get recurrent infections, there is da data showing you that if you have too many infections, you'll, it causes your MS to progress more rapidly. And so if you are having recurrent bladder infections, it's just not a good idea. And there are things that can be done to reduce your risks of getting recurrent bladder infections. And that needs to be actively managed. <clears throat> and then some of the medications we give out are not good for the brain. And so how do we reduce your burden of those drugs? So the drugs that are used for the bladder, anticholinergics, some of the older ones go into the brain and, and affect the way the brain functions. Similarly, over-the-counter antihistamines do the same. And so it's how we try and reduce your so-called anticholinergic burden uh, to improve your brain function. These all need to be tackled to improve outcome. <clears throat> The other thing we do is we do, uh, 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 we do a lot of uh, re research stuff. 
And so one of the reasons why we started the blog was to counteract what I call anti-science movements. <clears throat> okay. How many of you had CCSVI in this audience? Has anybody had CCSVI? There's one. So, okay. That, so what happened was about nine years ago, there was this theory that came out um, that MS was caused by blockage to the veins, the drainage of the veins. And so the treatment was to open up the... And that was based on a very, very poor study, which has been shown to be uh, false now. Uh, and possibly that original study was probably was possibly fraudulent, actually. A lot of people who study fraudulent studies suggest that it's got fraud in it. Mm. But anyway, it created a revolution out there, driven by social media. Okay? And people went all over the world and were ripped off, essentially. They were paid enormous amounts of money to have their veins opened, and it wasn't necessary. It didn't help those people at all. And so one of the reasons why we actually started with the blog was to actually counteract this thing called CCSVI. And you can see this is looking at Google Trends. This is actually looking at the searches over time. And you can see there was an epidemic. It went up, and then it's come down. It's almost disappeared now. Okay? The epidemic really was in Italy mainly and in Canada. Uh, and millions and millions of dollars worldwide are spent on these procedures. <clears throat> so we actually studied it on the blog. Uh, and uh, and anti-science movements have, a, uh, have a, a science behind them in itself, you, you, usually need a, you usually need a dissident scientist, somebody who's a maverick sitting outside there. You need a cultrepreneur, somebody who's going to make money out of it. Okay? You need a living icon, people who have a response, or a long-term survivor to promote it. You often need a praising or a journalist to support it, uh, and you need a politician as well. And actually, the, uh, the CCSVI had all of these, <clears throat> which is why it took off so rapidly. Anyway, we actually wrote that up in we, uh, our study, uh, and one of, the, one of the messages of our, uh, the study in the CCSBI thing is to a uh, call to arms that people like me and healthcare professionals need to get into social media, because this is where these things happen. We need to go in there early and counteract anti-science movements. Okay? People with multiple sclerosis are very vulnerable. <clears throat> they are susceptible to things like this. Okay, uh, and these people don't care. They all they want to do is make money out of you. <clears throat> so just be very careful about. And the, the one that's running at the moment is H is HSCT in HSCT units abroad. Okay, so please just be careful about falling for um, these what I call anti-science movements. Ask questions. Other thing is do is public engagement training. So uh, we did realize that we need a training. Talking to people like you requires different skills. And so um, Alison and a person called Becky Oldman, we used to work for Shift MS, um, they came and set up an education program teaching our group how to communicate science in a way that people understand. And so we have a, we've had refresher courses. <clears throat> it's how you debunk the jargon and keep the jargon out of it and try and make it understandable. Actually, we did to actually spread the course. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Becky's funding ran out, and so we, uh, we had to stop it. But most universities now have these courses uh, with, embedded within the university. They have courses to teach scientists and clinicians how to engage the public in science. <clears throat> okay. The other thing we thought we should do is tackle some of the um, controversial issues. Uh, so every year we put up a post on our blog asking for suggestions of what people would like the scientists to talk about. And so we managed to get ECTRIMS, which is the big European Congress of MS, and literally it's enormous now. When you go to ECTRIMS, there are 10,000 healthcare professionals there. This next one's in Berlin, and I would not be surprised if the Berlin meeting in, in next month will have 10,000 uh, delegates. <clears throat> and so they've given us a slot for the last five years where we do a burning debate. <clears throat> and the burning debate is usually around a very controversial topic. Uh, and so this last, so this is just one that we had, um, it was called uh, this, uh, Hauser versus Hafler, the B versus the T cell. These are two cells that cause MS. And we had a debate, uh, we called it the, the rumble in the jungle. Um, <clears throat> and it was actually very, very successful. And what happens is, is we um, get the ectrams to live stream the debate online, so you can watch it as a webinar. Uh, and hopefully uh, and deals with a controversial issue. Okay. As you can see, this particular one, when we were naughty, we, we took two heavyweights, uh, and it was chaired by a British uh, scientist called David Wraith, who's also an immunologist. Um, and um, uh, we feel extremely bad because 
it was all males. So this year we're going to have an all-female debate, okay? All right? <clears throat> and this actually, um, this debate this year is going to be around um, the new McDonald, the new diagnostic criteria for MS. They're quite controversial because they uh, change some of the rules in how we diagnose MS. And they have implications because some people who've just had one event and they've got clinical isolated syndrome will have MS under the new criteria. And is how do you apply these criteria? Do you go back and call those people back in and tell them they have got MS now or not? So there's quite a lot of controversy around these. So we're going to try and, in that debate, um, discuss those controversies. And um, if you log on to the Ectrim's website, you get the program, you'll be able to log into the webinar and watch the debate live. <clears throat> In addition to that, we also have a, a, um, a Hangout on Google Hangouts where uh, two scientists from my group, uh, Sharma Lee, she's a neurologist, and my partner, David Baker, the mouse doctor, they, they uh, um, do a, a daily Google Hangout where they explain uh, in, in lay language all the scientific findings that have been presented that day at the meeting. <clears throat> and you can ask questions by, um, uh, while they're online, and they can explain to you what's going on. <clears throat> the other thing we do, we do things like this. It's called research days uh, and roadshows. So roadshows actually, what we tend to do is um, the way that MA services in the UK are, we have a thing called the hub and a spoke. Do you know about those? So for example, in London, we've got six uh, MS centres, neuroscience centres in London. Now, you've got to understand that London, Greater London has got 15 million people. So it's three times the size of Ireland and we've got six centres in there. And then what happens is around each uh, centre we have what we call um, spokes. Those go to the district general hospitals. So we, we sit in East London, and so our spokes are hospitals like Basildon, Chelmsford, um, South, South End. And so what we tend to then do is we do roadshows. Once a year we go out as a team and go and do a, a meeting, usually in the evening, starts at half past five and runs to about eight or nine, where we get presentations and we answer questions to keep people up to date with what we're doing. And so we've been doing that now for quite a while. Um, the main reason for the roadshows is really to make people aware of what research is going on, so if they want to participate in our research studies, they can volunteer. <clears throat> and so um, they're very time consuming, but they are incredibly rewarding for us because um, they kind of create a camaraderie with us and our, and our, and our, our spokes. The other thing we do is we do research days, and this is just an example. Um, these have become extremely demanding of us, and now we've, had to, we've partnered with um, some, three other neuroscience centres, so we take it in turns. We were doing these every year, and we now do them every three years, our centre, but every year there's one done by another centre, and it's basically this. We, we um, design a programme, and the programme's not about necessarily about management of MS, it's about research, because people with the disease want to know what's going on in the research field. Uh, and we've actually changed the format. What we found was that people coming to boring lectures every day um, find it very tiring. So what we do is we have discussion tables and we, make, we give 20 minutes per talk, but uh, people are only allowed to talk for 10 minutes. So they've got to really get the message down into a very crisp message over 10 minutes. And then what happens is we stop and at each table there's a healthcare professional and people ask questions and discuss things. And then what happens is the healthcare professional moves around so people get to um, um, have a discussion. <clears throat> and we find that uh, that helps because what we did find when we were doing the lecture format is that there's usually one or two people that dominate all the questions. You know those kind of people? Yeah. And so there's other, pe there are other people who are less, uh, we want to ask questions, we feel intimidated, don't ask questions. In this way, those people get neutralized. Okay, and then everybody gets a chance to discuss things. <clears throat> um, so one of the things we do on the research day is we, uh, we create another infographic, and the infographic is essentially all the trials that we as a centre have been doing, the ones that are uh, uh, finished, ones that are running, uh, and ones that are recruiting, and ones that are planned. And, we, and so we create a list of students so people can ask, am I eligible for a trial? We're actually going to stop doing this now because the NHS has taken over from us. They've created a wonderful website uh, for people with any disease to go on and see what trials are recruiting. And I'm not sure if that ex resource exists in Ireland, but you really should push your healthcare system to do that. There's nothing more frustrating than not knowing what research you want to participate in. <clears throat> the other thing is we always promote 
we'll always uh, discuss on our on our blog any upcoming research uh, what's happening. Digesting science. So this is Alison, our designer's project. I think she's brought it. To, if, if not, she should bring it to Ireland. It's a brilliant thing. It's gone all over the world now. So digesting science is essentially a course to teach children of people with MS about the disease in a very unintimidating way. Uh, and so we usually limit it to about five or six families. Uh, they bring their children. It's targeting six to 12 year olds. We are in the process of designing a course for adolescents um, because it's more complicated with adolescents. And so what they do is they come there and they meet and greet and then they go through play stations and at each station they learn something about multiple sclerosis. So this station you can see there's a cylinder and there's a, a polystyrene ball and it's got Velcro on and inside there there's Velcro and the ball runs down and sticks. That's what happens in the brain. The, the white blood cell sticks and then passes through into the brain to cause MS. And then what they do is they coat it with tin foil and they roll it down and it doesn't stick. And that, that's illustrating one of the drugs. Which drug is that? It's natalizumab, hey? It's an anti-adhesion molecule. Okay, so it blocks the trafficking of cells into the brain. So we have a whole lot of little uh, devices to teach children or people with MS about how the disease works. <coughs> um, we also teach, we, we teach them about bladder dysfunction, walking problems, and they come away feeling very empowered. The reason why we did this, though, is about MS prevention. One of the things we always counsel our, our patients is that they should take vitamin D supplements and they should have their whole family on it, including the children. Because we think by keeping your vitamin D levels up, you can reduce the risk of getting MS in the future. And so one of the main messages of this is to tell the little children of the people that they've got to take their vitamin D tablets every day. And if they don't get them, they must ask, where are my vitamin D tablets? Okay. So it's about promoting prevention. <clears throat> We've also set up an advisory group, so this is very, very influential. So these are the people that make, a, they, uh, it's remarkable how they've uh, how it's transformed uh, people with MS's lives. It gives them purpose. So a lot of these people are unemployed because of the MS, and they've disconnected. And so by coming on our advisory group, they now have a role in actually designing our services. And so they come and sit there and they design services. So we don't put anything out from our group without co-design, without including the advisory group, brainstorming with them, designing it, testing it with them, getting feedback, retesting it with them. And so, uh, unfortunately, if somebody asks us to design anything new, it never happens quickly. It always takes a year to happen because the process of co-design and finessing it for the user is a time-consuming process. And so sometimes some pharmaceutical companies say, we would like you to design an information thing and we want it next month, and then Alison will say it's not possible. You know, the whole process of this takes time. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, our latest one, which has taken more than a year to get, it's coming, it's going to be produced. We're getting it, we're going to be, have it ready. I'm not sure if anybody's been treated with alemtuzumab, lemtrada in this room. <clears throat> so maybe you were told how to go on the Listeria diet. Did they just give you a piece of paper? They just told you to get the pregnancy diet. Now, we know from studies it doesn't work in most people. Most people do not stick to the diet. And unfortunately, there's a risk of about one in 400 of getting this infection from food stuffs and dying from it. No, not dying from it. One in 400 of getting the infection, and there's a small risk of dying from it. There was a death, unfortunately, of a woman in, in Bristol that triggered this. And so we then discovered that there was a whole literature around this particular infection in the oncology space, because in chemotherapy, patients are also at risk. And so what you have to actually do, and they've discovered this, is you have to have a, a, a behavioral therapy program to activate patients to go home and think about their diets. And so what the, what the little pack is, it's a basically a little information booklet. <clears throat> it gives them a card for their wallet. It gives them a, a card for the kitchen. And it gives them stickers for their food. It teaches them to go into their fridge and do an audit to look at all their food substances, all their foods, how many have passed their sell-by or use-by dates, and it gives them a little thermometer, then they've got to measure the temperature, because the temperature has to be five degrees or lower, and that has to be in the top shelf, because I don't know if you're aware, most thermometers in fridges are usually in the lower or the mid shelf, and the top shelf is often much, low, much higher temperature than the bottom. And so the, you've got to set the dial so the top shelf is at least five or lower, okay, in terms of health. And so by doing this, is pro activating them to go home and do this just makes them stick to the diets because it makes them realize it's quite a serious issue. 
and to try and prevent uh, the listeriosis thing. <clears throat> so this was designed by our MS advisory group. Um, the other thing is the politics. It's not only about their policy document. We also use our blog um, to take industry to task. So um, I don't know if you've been aware, there's been a big backlash against the pharmaceutical industry because they don't publish their results or they don't release their results. And they've been pressurized into actually sharing their, res their, their data now via a portal that's run by the Wellcome Trust. Some of these companies, they refuse to put, even though they signed up to this agreement, refuse to put certain trials in. And so what we do is we name and shame them. Uh, Eli Lilly is the one we really took to task because they've got a very interesting uh, drug that they used in MS and then they never published the results or never presented the results. We assume it was a negative study. Actually, we know it's negative. And so we named and shamed them. We got a petition going and, we, uh, and they actually agreed to uh, present and publish the results because it's, it's, it's unethical not to publish results of a neg even a negative trial because the lessons learned from negative trials inform us about other trials. And so this particular compound was targeting um, a particular cell, the B cell, and the fact that it failed is very important for the community to know about. Anyway, so we named and shamed Lil Eli Lilly, and they have published the results. At least presented the results at a meeting, and hopefully we'll publish it. But we think we had something to do with that, okay? <laughs> because the, the chief uh, scientific officer actually contacted us, and we had a teleconference with him, and we told him why. And he said, okay. The reason is there's no incentive for companies once they've got a negative study to publish because it, it, it costs, costs money and resource. But somebody's got to take them to task. <clears throat> and then, I, and then um, I just want to say to you that um, the brain health document, I would urge you all to read this document. You can download it from, the, from this website. Um, we've got now over 50 endorsers. So these are people, these are organizations that are engaged with MS, and that's the first time this has ever happened in this space, that we've managed to get endorsements from virtually all the organizations that are important in the management of MS. So this is how we, this is the framework for how we should be managing MS in 2018. It's not about any specific therapy, it's about a philosophy about how we should manage this disease. And that's why we're so adamant that we've got to get this thing activated in a, in a much more proactive way. If you read this document, the full one, and it's written by professional writers in a lay way, so it's very understandable. Okay, if you understand this document, then you understand how your MS should be managed. And then we do research. <clears throat> so one of the things we wanted to do was an add-on study um, of a neuroprotective drug. It was, uh, um, one of the problems about the design of the study is that we wanted to do multiple lumbar punctures. So we put the grant application in and the funders rejected it, saying it's not going to be possible. Nobody's going to sign up to four lumbar punctures. And so we actually used our blog to explain to people why we were doing the study, and they came back with, they came back with a survey, and the survey said, yes, we're prepared to participate in four lumbar punctures. That was the first issue. We had, and we went back to the funders, and they agreed to fund it. Our biggest problem is that we call the study secondary progressive. <clears throat> we included secondary progressive in the, in the, in the information sheet. And um, nobody wants to diagnose secondary progressive MS anymore. So you know, people try and avoid making that diagnosis. So we had problems getting people referred into the trial because the trial was targeting early secondary progressive MS. <clears throat> so if anybody's designing a clinical trial, just call it advanced or worsening MS. Just drop the term progressive. <clears throat> Anyway, it took, it took us two years longer than uh, we planned to recruit, and we, the trial finished way over time, uh, and uh, the results are available. I can't tell you what they are. They still, we're waiting for the final trial report, but hopefully we'll be able to present this in the next uh, six to 12 months, the results of the trial. But without the blog, though, and without people <clears throat> participating on the blog, we would never have got this funded. So this is also how we use our public engagement. And the, t and the name was actually volunteered by the community. We asked them for the name. Part of that was generating a, a little uh, application to explain lumbar punctures that came out of the, this. And there's also on our Clinic Speak site a little, small little application about what the lumbar puncture is and how it's done. We've also used the blog for crowdfunding. Some people have suggested uh, crowdfunding, and we did a small crowdfunding by a, a, um, a company called Crowd of Cure, and we raised the money literally within three weeks from our readers. And the trial's finished, and we published the results. It was a very, very neat little exercise, this. <clears throat> so I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> All I want to say is um, our, our next, and I haven't had time to go through that in detail, 
Um, but on our website, there's whole issues around self-monitoring. We're trying to push people with, the, with multiple sclerosis to self-monitor themselves. So if you go to our Clinic Speak website, <clears throat> you'll see things there called the EDSS calculator, the 9 peg test, time 25-foot walk, and we're going to put one onto uh, uh, cognition. I'm urging you all to self-monitor yourselves, uh, because if you know what's happening to your MS, you'll be able to go to your neurologist and say, hell, I'm doing well, I'm not doing so well, what can you do about it? So having um, data in your fingertips uh, in terms of self-monitoring is very, very important. Um, I've created another, I've created my own um, slide share, so that's called Prof G slide share, and I've got my, all my presentations I've done since I started, since, since uh, LinkedIn suspended my slide share account. I've created my own one. <clears throat> so you can see I already put on, on the site MS Island 2018. You can click on that. The two presentations, one from yesterday and one today, is on there. There's another little link that takes you to a, um, a, 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 a folder, and you can download the presentations. Okay? It's called Prof G slide share. Simple. Simple, yeah. You just, just, just Google it, you'll find it. Okay? And this is by our team. Thank you very, very much. And at the bottom over there, there's all these uh, links that you want, might want to follow. Thank you very much. Kevin, thank you very much. Here's a little token of our, uh, of our appreciation. Hopefully, uh, it'll fit in your suitcase on your way back. Oh, this is great. Uh, yeah, and uh, a little pen there as well. Come so, visit you in Dingle. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Professor Gavin Giovanni, everyone. And, and safe home.